Dean Smith from the great state of Western Australia. Thanks for your company. Great to be here. Let me ask you about uh, last week. It was pretty messy between the former Prime Minister and the current Prime Minister. Do they need to have it out, do you think, to sort of try to ensure that this doesn't become a distraction? Well, I think there's probably near unanimous agreement it was uh, unedifying. But if we keep our eye on the substance of the week, uh, the government was able to continue to deliver. Deliver backpackers tax gets through the House, the plebiscite bill gets through the House, industrial relations reforms gets through the House. So uh, a distraction uh, reinforces the importance of uh, discipline. Um, but speaking to Liberals over the weekend, uh, many of us will feel very satisfied that we've got both Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull in the parliamentary party. But what about ensuring that it doesn't become an ongoing distraction? Because I, I hear what you're saying. Mitch Fifield said something similar to Paul Kelly and I yesterday about the achievements of the government and what it's managing to do despite some of these distractions. But it, it reminds me to some extent of when Labor, over the previous three years, when they were in government, were talking about achievements. But of course, the distraction was the thing that was always front and centre. Well, you do always want to make sure that these things are rare instances so they don't become uh, systemic, uh, that they don't encourage others to perhaps display a lack of uh, discipline. But if we keep our eye focused on the reform task, keep our eye focused on what we need to get through the Senate and the House of Representatives over the last three remaining weeks, uh, I think we'll end the year in a good position. One of the things that's not on the agenda but might be with where there seems to be some movement is the issue of 18C. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know you've had views on this that you've mm -hmm. expressed before. Quite a few Liberals on the backbench have been mm -hmm. strong in their views on this. The, the former Prime Minister has made clear that he regrets uh, not seeing through with some reform on mm -hmm. this front. But at the moment, members of the executive within the coalition keep saying this isn't something that is on the agenda. Should it be and will it be, do you think, this term? Well, there's, there's no doubt that if you're talking to ordinary Australians, economic management, budget repair are the stand-out priorities for the government. Uh, but we can be talking about important issues of principle, like freedom of speech. Uh, and it's true. Uh, senators like myself have spent a lot of time on this issue. Indeed, the Senate has spent a lot of time on this issue. I think the task is twofold. One is that there is a consensus of reform building in the community, uh, not just amongst parliamentarians, but I would argue broadly across the community. Well, uh, can I ask on that? Mm. Because what's interesting about that is uh, you could easily argue that during the Abbott era mm. uh, that consensus wasn't there. But the QUT students, what's happening at the moment to Bill Leake, you know, disclaimer, I do write for The Australian, it does feel to me like the, there's been a shift in, in sentiment, or at least if there hasn't been, perhaps there should be? Well, I think that what characterised the debate early was the theoretical. Mm. What's characterising the debate now is the practical experience. Uh, and the law should be constantly under review, and particularly when young students, like those QUT students, are, are now sort of, you know, at the coalface of the law, then I think that it should be top of mind for the government with other issues. I do think that as parliamentarians we need to broaden the debate. Uh, the fact that it is a debate that preoccupies the minds and interests of senators uh, is both a strength but it's also a weakness. Uh, we saw with the Australian Law Reform Commission report, uh, it believed it was time for reform. I think we can broaden the parliamentary discussion, uh, have a parliamentary inquiry so that all points of view across the community can be canvassed and, and, and the views that I and others might have are challenged as well. How, how close is the government if it were to adopt the changes and therefore you assume the executive on mass votes with backbenchers that have signed on to that petition in the mm, Senate? Mm, mm. How close is the government to being able to cobble together a majority in the Senate? Because it obviously has it in the lower house if no one crosses the floor. Everyone's interests, I think, are supported by broadening the discussion, broadening the discussion. Internally, in our party, that means House members having more to say about this sort of, this sort of issue. Um, a bill in the Senate would not be successful at the moment. While consensus has been building, uh, there's not enough majority support in the Senate. But on these issues, I think that time is working in favour of those like myself that support reform. And remembering that this reform proposition is different from the original reform proposition. It's more limited. It's more limited, more limited. Uh, and I think that is a very, very safe place to have a community discussion. Would you be hopeful that it could happen in this 45th Parliament? Always hopeful, always hopeful. Because what we've seen is that the, the practical experience of people is now front and centre. 
and that should be cause for concern for parliamentarians like myself and others. I've got to ask you about same-sex marriage. Um, it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, there's not many people who follow politics that wouldn't know that, that you took what can only be labelled as a courageous decision. I don't mean in the yes minister sense, although perhaps that <laughs> well, too. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps that too. Right, perhaps, uh, on the yeah. issue, You're, you are planning to cross the floor. Uh, it has passed through the lower house, the mm. same-sex yep. marriage plebiscite mm. bill. Uh, are you feeling as strong about this now as it's becoming more imminent that the Senate will look, about, look well, at it? Well, what I've said very, very clearly is that I will not support the plebiscite bill. Uh, I'm not only opposed to plebiscites on this issue, I'm posed to plebiscites more generally. Uh, this, this week, actually, is the 100th anniversary of the first plebiscite in our country, uh, and it was on the issue of conscription in 1916. And as someone, you know, like yourself, who pays a lot of attention to sort of constitutional issues and constitutional history, I'm curious why in the 1890s, when we framed our constitution, plebiscites were absent. And then early in the Commonwealth, in 1916-17, we experimented with plebiscites and then have never gone back to plebiscites as a way of resolving issues for such a long time, with the exception of the plebiscite of 1977, which was about our national song, which, with all due respect to the national song, is not an issue of such sort of... It's not divisive. It's not divisive. Is, and it is the role of Parliament, and that's been the long-established principle in our country. We've done it on other contentious issues, RU486, divorce law reform. Um, this is not the time and not the issue to experiment with plebiscites. So when you say you won't support it, yep. does that mean that you might abstain? Well, uh, I, I hope it doesn't come down to one vote. I hope it doesn't come down to one vote because I won't be able to support the plebiscite bill. Uh, if, it, if, if the margin is more comfortable, then I will most definitely abstain. OK. Uh, let me ask you, staying on this subject, if it is defeated in the Senate, and mm. for all practical purposes it looks like whether you did or didn't cross the floor, that is where we're heading here, mm. what should the government do? No one in, in the executive arm of government wants to talk about Plan B, but governments <laughs> have to have a Plan B. Well, um, I think the government's position is crystal clear, and the Prime Minister's position is crystal clear. The government's path to marriage is via the plebiscite, full stop. But the government is a subset of the parliament. The parliament is not a subset of the government. So should the parliament decide to uh, test the issue again, that's obviously the, the free will of the parliament. Um, but I'd be arguing that it shouldn't be done at the expense of government time because issues like budget repair and those sure. sorts of things are important. There are precedents, there are models. The parliament has done this before, like I said, on RU486 and other contentious issues. Um, when it would be extraordinary, though, wouldn't it, if, if the Parliament, through a free vote, or through a vote, doesn't have to be a free vote, mm -hmm. if the Parliament, through a vote, brought about a change to the Marriage Act after the Prime Minister didn't advocate for it, that would be pretty extraordinary. Well, I, I don't think the distinction is that clear, because uh, everyone agrees with a parliamentary vote. Where there is the point of difference is how you get to the parliamentary vote. Whether you need a plebiscite. Exactly, exactly. That's the only point of difference. It's the difference of, about methodology getting to a parliamentary vote. Everyone is agreed that a parliamentary vote should happen. It's about how you get to that. Um, people will have different views. Um, some people, I think, will be wanting to delay the issue. I, I pressed. I think it is in the government's issue, interest to have the issue dealt with one way or another quickly. See, I couldn't agree with you more on that. that politically speaking, away from the value of where you sit on the issue, I think mm. politically the government needs this off the agenda, uh, whichever way uh, that vote went. Mm. Do you think most of your colleagues agree with you and I in this context? Well, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that most people have been focused on the plebiscite sure. and focused on whether or not the plebiscite bill will pass the House, let's tick that box, uh, whether it will pass the Senate. But um, there is clearly a group in... The three, there are three groups in the community. There are those that are committed to yes, those that are committed to no. Uh, but I think there's an increasingly large number in the mi middle who are, are fatigued by the issue, but I don't mean that in the sense that they want it to go away. They want it to be dealt with. Mm. Uh, and I think it's pretty dis defensible that at least once in the life of this parliament the issue should be tested, but not at the expense of the government's priorities. How concerned are you about uh, what we've already reported on throughout the day here on Sky News, which is the growth, according to the polls, of the support of One Nation? Mm -hmm. This, I think for centre-right parties like, uh, like ours, this, this is an important issue. Uh, the first thing is we should not dismiss the sentiment. Uh, for someone who spends a lot of time across regional communities, change is happening. Some people are much more comfortable with that change. Uh, some people are less comfortable with the uncertainty of that. 
So the challenge for us is not to dismiss the certainty. Can but I just to, ask you on that? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but mm. when, when, you, when you say don't dismiss the, the, the sentiment, uh, are you talking about uh, don't confuse people being disillusioned and voting for One Nation with particular stances that some One Nation people take? Well, I think that the onus is on us to argue for reform better make the case for reform and give people a sense that when we've reformed in the past, uh, abolishing tariffs, those sorts of things, the country has got prosperous. Mm. Uh, some communities have got very, very prosperous and particularly across regional communities. So in arguing our case for reform, I think we need to be patient with other people. The onus needs to be on us to make the case and make it well. Uh, but once we start saying, as there was a temptation to do, one Nation people don't deserve to be represented in the Senate. Uh, one Nation people, if we do dismiss the people and the sentiment too much, we're going to find ourselves in a lot of trouble. So, is this a particular issue, would you argue, for Queensland and Western Australia? Because those, of course, we know from when One Nation was founded mm. were strongholds yeah. uh, for One Nation. And this polling seems to be reflecting similar uh, geographical spreads. Well, if you look at the economic experience uh, across the country at the moment, uh, you don't need to be Einstein to know that in Western Australia and Queensland, the fall off in commodity prices is being um, felt the most. Uh, they are the most regional uh, states that we have. Uh, they are the states that will go to the polls first. So speculation about One Nation support will be tested first in Western Australia in March next year uh, and later in Queensland. So it is a live issue for uh, the Coalition. I think the Prime Minister going to Queensland is a very, very important first step. And just finally, in your home state, uh, as one of those state governments that's going to face re-election shortly, it's going to be a tough one for the Barnett government. I mean, it's had some internal issues recently. Mm. Uh, whatever you think of the opposition, uh, they're ahead in the polls and now you throw into that mix the One Nation phenomena feels a lot like the court government <laughs> at the end of the court government period where One Nation also played a timing role. And I was at the coalface in 2001 uh, with Richard Court during that election. Um, Labor should not be underestimated in Western Australia. Getting a third term is difficult, but I think the government is on the right track. Uh, it's all about energy and enthusiasm and talking about issues that are important to West Australians. Senator Dean Smith, appreciate you joining us. I know you've got a flight to catch. Thanks for your time. Great, thank you. Cheers.